Hello, uh, welcome you all to our panel discussion on work-life blend for researchers, self-actualization, work and choices. My name is Satyavati Kharde and I'm a product manager at Springer Nature Pune office. Um, I will be moderating today's session and we have with us Dr. Rashmi Kumar. She is associate director in the office learning resources at University of Pennsylvania. We have Dr. Vinay Nandikuri, who is a director at CCMB India. We have Dr. Prithrotha Salvi, who is a assistant professor at ICER Berhampur. And we have Dr. Rajiv Ahuja, who is a director at IIT Roper. Welcome you all. Uh, so uh, we, we are here to discuss about the new normal and the work-life balance that can potentially help us all to better compartment, uh, compartmentalize our research, studies, and elements of life that are very essential for our well-being. Uh, a very much needed topic during this time of pandemic. And we are very excited about the panel discussion. And we will take us all through step by step as how our panel and our expert researchers have gone through the pandemic, how they have uh, figured out how we are going to battle. Um, they have been huddling to, uh, to uh, in, in, in the research and day-to-day -day life and the effect of pandemic. So before we start, a quick housekeeping points. The audience in this session is on mute. If you have any questions, please put them in the question panel and we will take them either during the session or towards the end of the session. So let's begin. The first session is on the journey through COVID times. Uh, so this phase of COVID has been very unsettling and different to all of us. Uh, so what are, the, what are some major changes that we have experienced in our work and balancing elements in our life? So Dr. Rashmi, can you please give us some walkthrough to your time during COVID? Absolutely. Thank you, Satyavati. So uh, welcome everyone, I'm excited to be here um, and I'm going to share a PowerPoint just to help ourselves acclimate to it. Okay, so now this seems like a heavy topic, but it really is not in the sense that we are just making a slight shift, but that slight shift has huge impact on how we conduct ourselves at work and in life. And you have all heard the topic before, the, the phraseology of work-life balance, but that seemed to have gone on the side. And now what we are talking about is work-life blend, especially because you cannot just say, you know, I'll work nine to five, get up in the morning, go to work, interact with my colleagues, have a cup of coffee with them. And at five, I leave and I do things independent of work. So now we are finding that because many of us are taking care of children, so how many people on this panel have children at home? Everybody has children. Everyone has children. How many of you are single? How many of you are married and your spouse needs emotional or physical support? I'm not you know looking for specific answers but i am just giving us probes to think about how many of us take care of elderly parents who may live with us or who live in other cities and towns states but still need support so all that has changed especially during covid our children were still with us. We were still taking care of parents. But now those parents are able to get less support. The children are able to get less socialization, which has a huge impact on children. So work-life blend has come into being 
as a analogy of Tetris. Tetris is a puzzle making system. And so when you are in this work life blend system, you're trying to fit in many things at the same time. They're not compartmentalized as they used to be. You could be doing work early in the morning, then seeing to meals for family, coming back to work again with a little break. Maybe you need to do some key errands. You come back to work. So I find that my work starts at usually 4 a.m. in the morning. And I try to cull it by 8 p.m. at night. But it does not mean I'm working from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. It means that in between the day, I pull out time that helps me to manage work and life as successfully as is possible. So I'd like you to think about what does work-life blend mean to you? Take a minute, think about why it applies to you and how do you see the opportunities and challenges in sustaining a healthy work-life blend? Try to shift your mind from a work-life balance to a work-life blend and see what difference does it make to the terminology, to the impact on your well-being, to the impact on your efficiency, and to the impact of maintaining joy in your life. So I'm going to now stop the slideshow and I would, you know, whether people want to put it in the chat or they want to think about it, however you like to do things. So I'll take Satyavati's lead on that. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rashmi. While we think about it, uh, Dr. Vinay, can you please help us? How was it for you? What were some major changes that happened in your work and balancing elements in your life? Thank you, Satya. Um, I used to work at National Institute of Immunology, which has 35 faculty, 150 students, 60 or so project associates, and 300, almost 300 support staff. This is actually a residential campus, mostly, other than the support staff. So when the first lockdown was implemented on March 24, 2020, like many other institute, our institute completely shut down with exception of going there to maintain equipments and all, nobody was allowed into the labs at all. So there was this particular fear of unknown because nobody realistically know what we were getting into, a territory which was completely um, something that we did not know. This level of pandemic is last time it was hit. It was way back in 1918, right? Nobody has seen and none of us have seen a pandemic in our lifetime. So there was a huge level of fear of unknown and you know which essentially led to even though we are researchers kind of led to a uh, problem of closing down everything and just trying to wash your hands too many times kind of a stuff many students actually left for home because of this uh, lockdown and all those things my wife is actually a faculty in delhi university um, and uh, my son is an engineering family year student everybody was at home now my mother is, lives in Bangalore. My mother-in-law lives in Puttaparthi. Everybody is, and there was this particular worry of their old age, what happens to them. All these things were hanging around, and it's kind of difficult at that point of time. I've never stayed home for this long a period since 1991 when I was doing my, after my master's, before I started PhD. So it's like, it was kind of a balance. You know, we had to give space to each other. We wanted to do work at home. So what we all developed a certain patterns so that this lockdown doesn't get to us, right? I, I would, we would focus, I would focus on writing manuscripts and I would talk to my students. So my wife would do something very similar. She wrote a review around that time. We also look at the, these lockdown days as a typical working day and have some level of a discipline. You start at a particular point of time, stick to the routine so that 
there is not you know you don't feel the concept of uh, you know you're always at home kind of a thing and go for a small walk in the evening and then come back and stick to your lockdown so it was tough but it's something that we kept our routine going I, even when i got back to my lab after one month things were not normal i could go to the lab full time but my students only two of them were allowed at any point of time it was tough on them too you know they were all stuck at hostels and you know we are lab we are experimental biologists for us not to come to the lab means you're not doing anything how much will you read so eventually it was always an issue so to give you a picture two people were allowed at any point of time i i used to have 10 people so if two people are allowed at any point of time yeah, on a day i can't cover them and so it was kind of tough uh, but you know one thing that kept us going is i believe that is what is needed was positive thinking reasonable discipline and i the particular concept that this too shall pass thank you thank dr you. Dr. Selvi, how about you? How, what were the major changes? Thanks, Satya. So um, I have to say that the word unprecedented entered into our vocabulary after the COVID pandemic. And it, it's been an unbe unbelievable time period. Uh, but I have to say that um, Zoom calls and uh, online meetings moved from just being for academic settings to family settings. Like we started uh, chatting with our families and friends. Uh, there used to be our TGIF sessions, which we used to have in Europe. Uh, we used to have it on Zoom. So we people were trying to reach out to each other. Um, so I would have to say that there was an initial lull in the first couple of weeks where we just thought, you know, no particular um, timing. You just wake up when you want. But then we realized that if you want to be on track and not let the pandemic get to you, your mental health, your well-being, then what requires is to have that discipline. You know, think about Monday to Saturday as your working days, stick to the timing, and then um, Sunday could be your off day. And I would actually like to mention that uh, this experience came from, I remember when my father had retired. So he had spent uh, like, he was uh, a senior official in the Indian government, uh, Ministry of Labor. He was always on the run. And when he retired, we called him, he was a ball of energy who did not know what to do. So through the week, he devised a plan. Monday, I'll go to the bank. Tuesday, I'm going to do this. So that way, he knew that this is how we have to keep ourselves going. So eventually, um, things started looking OK. We started uh, coming into the research labs. So I think what changed was we all started looking for each other, after each other. And I think that has increased uh, during this pandemic time. Thank you, Dr. Selvi. Dr. Rajiv, how about you? Yeah, thank you. Uh, what I will like to say that uh, on this point that we have to be nice to ourselves first, actually. And if we want to pass this transition period, and as uh, we all was not prepared for this one. So so now, uh, suppose if you were working only, it's like that you are, you lose one arm, you are working with one arm only. So, so of course, uh, this one arm has to bear a lot of load because you don't have the second arm. Second arm means you can go out and you can work in offices and, uh, and you can interact and collaborate with your colleagues and that, has gone now so but uh, we are learning and now this pandemic is we are working almost uh, more than a year so now we know how to plan it of course we all are working at least three hours extra compared to what we used to work and in in principle your mind is working maybe 24 hour so that's uh, mind never get to, uh, peace uh, when you work from home because it's always in your mind going on and other thing that one thing, uh, you know, everything has a good and bad. And pandemic uh, bring us a lot of positive thing also. You, we can never think about this kind of meeting before. We always try to have all conferences were offline only. Even now also, if there is some online conference, you don't feel excited because you want to go you know, offline. So I do, 
even international conference, whatever conference, you, you don't feel excited. And other thing pandemic brings like, uh, as Vinay mentioned that he was uh, traveling a lot before he never stay at home. This is same for us also, for me also. At least we get a lot of quality time with our family. That's a positive point, we, which we will never having retirement in fact, but uh, you can see sometime you come to the uh, home, your kids are sleeping, you go, kids are, now it's not like that situation. You are working from home, you see every day growing them in front of your eyes. So that's a positive thing we have to take. And the uh, only thing I want that uh, you, uh, we have to kind to ourselves also during this pandemic time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, at, at home, we have certain routines. At, at work, we have certain routines. However, there might be certain challenges when you are in a position to lead. Uh, so, Dr. Vinay, what were the changes that you, as the director, had to adopt rather quickly for, for your institute? You know, you, you didn't have time, but you had to just quickly adopt to it. Okay. Considering that we are a research lab, working remotely is not really an option. And to qualify this, I was mostly a scientist during the pandemic. I became director only on 1st June. So I will talk about my experiences as such. During the first wave and most of the second wave, I was the faculty at NII. We had quite a few cases in the campus too. The emphasis, the emphasis was on quarantine of the primary contacts, closing the labs for a week and opening up when you find them negative. During the second peak, I mean that, however, the number of positives in the first peak were pretty limited. Second peak, however, hit us like a wave, huge tsunami wave. During the second peak, there was quite a lot of positives even in the campus. Many students got infected. And the, however, the institute did not go into complete lockdown because I think we kind of know how to deal with this compared to the first wave. So instead, we focused on going 50% attendance and making sure that people who are traveling do not come to the institute. And uh, we, we emphasized on social distancing, take out, take out lunch and dinner for the students and masking up as much as possible, not as much, completely. So if anybody in the lab turned positive, we quarantined all the members of the lab, including the PI for a week, tested them. If they are negative, we got them back. Otherwise, they stayed for 15 days that way. Towards the end of the second week, or I would say around 60%, I, became, I came to Hyderabad as the director. I remember entering the airport, it was empty, literally. I mean, relatively empty into the aircraft only what 30% uh, or 20% was full at that time and you know all the it was a very odd feeling I was traveling after almost 15 months for the first time after 15 months so it was a very odd feeling but anyway I started in CCMB on 1st June by then the second week was started coming down and many parts of India kind of started opening up partly lockdown was lockdown was still in place in Hyderabad I continued with the policies of my predecessor, Dr. Rakesh Mishra, um, and there was a lot of flexibility that he had implemented in CCMB, right? So there was a lot of flexibility in working hours with only 50% used to come for the work and canteen was providing food as a takeout, COVID protocols and social distancing, air circulation systems, wherever possible were in place. So many people in CCMB were involved in COVID related work. So a lot of people were luckily vaccinated because they were involved in the work. The emphasis was always on social distancing and wearing masks. Towards the end of the June, Hyderabad started lifting its lockdown. I mean, actually opened up completely. So the challenge as an institute director is to decide on how much to open, how soon to open, right? So how many things like to open many things like canteen, how many, how soon people can start coming back in person, uh, stuff like that. All these decisions were based on discussions. You cannot take these things, okay, I'm going to say tomorrow onwards everybody comes. Discussions of a COVID working committee. Even though we were opening, we have opened up now quite a lot. We're masking up is still considered absolutely mandatory. Uh, social distancing uh, protocols are in place. Canteen and other places where we are all the more so careful about it. We are now going towards as much as possible slowly and cautiously towards opening up as completely as possible and i really hope that we do not have to go back right that's what i hope thank you thank you dr 
at, at organization level, these are the changes. But as a group leader, so Dr. Selvi, um, and as a teacher, which role required you to embrace sooner yeah, and to adopt quicker? Uh, I would say um, because my research group was relatively new, my lab is uh, not yet two years old. So I think the research part uh, did take a backstage because uh, I did not have people yet in the lab. Uh, only my first PhD student was here and he was still doing his coursework. So I think it was kind of a choice um, that I did not make. It ended up uh, because of the uh, reason that the teaching part took uh, the front stage. And what happened was the students, um, in fact, we remember we were having our uh, inter ISER fest that time, and then the lockdown was imposed the next day. So the students went home uh, really, really very sad uh, to have been sent home at that point where they were enjoying being in this place. And within a few weeks, I think there was a lot of um, uh, uncertainty about what's going to happen to their coursework and there were uh, students who were going to go off and do their projects their host labs had refused to take them in so there was a lot of uncertainty and what we did was uh, together we decided that let's not uh, get drawn into this uh, black hole of despair uh, let's start putting our energy together towards a positive vibe so what we did was together we started reaching out to the community here. Uh, so as an outreach activity, we started off writing um, articles, COVID-related papers. We started simplifying it for the larger ISA community. Because as you know, ISA Barhampur is a new institute and we are not just biologists. We have chemists, physicists, math mathematicians as well. So I think that kind of uh, kept us going and then I would have to say that there was a plus point here because when I came, I'm, I'm an experimental biologist. I love to work at the bench, but because of my teaching responsibilities, I could not really do what I wanted to do. And this, this pandemic and post lockdown meant that the lab was free. So I could actually start off getting the cultures out and doing some preliminary experiments, uh, which whenever the students came in, they could start off. So we'd have to say mixed feelings, but overall we decided to channel our energy uh, to keep us and keep us towards looking positive and yes, believing that this too shall pass. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Selly. So uh, as a student uh, in the biology lab, you know, it's, it's very natural that we want to be in the lab. Uh, however, uh, we have technology institute. So Dr. Uh, Rajiv, so you, you are a director at IIT, uh, which is a technology institute. Um, and you have students at various uh, stages of their careers, of their studies. Uh, what was the major priority for you to focus on at, during this time? Uh, and, and to facilitate uh, learning, basically, yeah. Uh, so the big main challenge was that uh, uh, how to bring and how to put uh, everything at a, in a one picture so they can all be benefited for this one. For example, we have a BTEC student. They're the engineering graduates. Then we have a master and MTech students. And then we have a PhD student. Their main focus is the research. So research was suffering. So we try to open the research part. So we have now our labs running. And when it comes to the, as you know that we have a BTEC in first year, second year, third year, fourth year student. And I can tell you that the first year student has already finished one first year and they have not seen the institute. So that is challenge to bring them at least uh, this year to, on the campus. And the fourth year student is more important for us because this is their final year and their career depends on the fourth year. So we call them also on the campus actually they were always on the campus fourth year and the phd student during whole lockdown uh, since i uh, i started at iit roper so even there was no classes uh, offline they were sitting in a hostel and joining the classes online so at least and they can get some kind of access to the labs also 
and we put the on priority because uh, BTEC students, their campus interviews we held, so they have to be on the campus. And other thing we have, um, because in fourth year, uh, you have to do your internships. And now since lockdown, there's no company is uh, open to take interns because a lot of things are in under lockdown. How we should we do? So we have started the online internships, not with, with, with the companies, but within the institute, uh, we have devised uh, online internship. And this internship was not only open for our uh, fourth year student, but it open for all our all technical institutes all over India. So that uh, let's let them finish. And this part, which internship is a crucial part, is like that you become a doctor without internship. So that's uh, internship is so important uh, for even engineers also, because after that they will go in a public life, they will work for a uh, industry, they will work for a government. So, so we have uh, prioritized uh, in that basis and we are lucky enough, we ever able to run uh, our campus during this tough, the peak time and the second wave peak time. And we are looking that um, in the future also, uh, I thought uh, we think that uh, this pandemic will, be, pandemic will over. We will all have a full time on the campus, but uh, we still think that uh, we, when we are thinking to start in now in August, the session, we will start also in a hybrid mode, uh, not a fully offline or online mode. So, so this is how, uh, we are running IIT and we are strictly following SOPs. What uh, Vinay also mentioned already, we are very strict in following the SOP. That's why we can keep this campus safe because when a student, they are here, we are like their parents. So we have to keep them and uh, we have a responsibility from their parents to keep them safe. So this is our first priority at IITs. And we always say that educational institute are for, for the student. Without a student, there's no educational institute. So we have to take care of them first before we take care of ourselves. So this is why we are managing our IIT. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv. I, I think it's very important that you said, right, the priority is safety. And then to be a regulated opening for students to learn. Yes, so Dr. Rashmi, you have been a coach for work-life blending. Um, and as a coach, what were the points or the key points you had to consider uh, uh, keeping uh, the pandemic in mind and also maintaining the pace of STEM learning. Thanks, Satavati. So uh, we were sent into a lockdown on March 13th, 2020, on a two-day notice when we were told it's going to be a lockdown, you will not be able to come to the campus. The first thing that I remember was making sure I had all the technology. So I downloaded all the files on an external hard drive because I knew I would have to work from home. Even though I do have uh, remote access to my office machines, I wanted to make sure the files were with me. Now, at Penn, many of our students especially the masters and graduate students. So we divide the students into three categories, what you call bachelors, masters, and the professional schools, which includes the students in the medical school, the dental medical school, students who are going for PhDs, law, and business. And we look at their calendars sometimes cumulatively, but sometimes with a key focus of what their responsibilities are and how they are going to be differentiated. So for example, Selvi was talking about bench experiences. For the undergraduate or the bachelors, they were mailed the kits at home with reformed experiments. So each student, no matter where they were living, uh, they received large boxes of kits that they could do the experiments with. Now it's possible on a bachelor's level. You cannot do that at a PhD level or in the medical school because they have to come and experience with the real organisms, the real bacteria. So research for them was tough. 
and they were moved into working groups where they could brainstorm, develop ideas, develop proposals for future research. So they are still immersed in that thought process, however, with a different lens, and that made a difference. Working groups for the senior students was a blessing because it allowed them to keep their socialization. And these were not working groups ad hoc. They were mandatory working groups, as if you are taking attendance in a class. But each working group had a responsibility, a goal, and a delegated breakdown of who is doing what. It allowed a lot of enthusiasm instead of apathy and saying, I don't have enough things to do. They also were able to publish during that time because we were actually, our um, university was involved in the Moderna BioNTech vaccine. So when you have vaccines and when you have a pandemic, there are actually multiple opportunities to write and publish, and to write and publish through a different aspect. To write and publish in collaboration with our university people and with people outside our university, whether they belong to NIH. Um, I know people were working greatly with European countries, and then there was a lot of psychological, sociological research that was being conducted in South Asia, India, Bangladesh, and so on. So those aspects of research changed, but research did not stop. Now, we were in a complete lockdown because the number of deaths, fatalities, from COVID-19 were very high till January 21. And so our master's students were allowed to come back. They had to get tested every week. Our medical students, dental medical students, law students, they came back on 25% capacity. So when labs were open, they were open at 25% capacity. That means you have to have each session four times in order to serve 100% capacity. And that puts a lot of strain on the staff and faculty in terms of management, in terms of assessment, in terms of resource allocation. And that is what we learned from March 13th when we went into lockdown till June, we were still trying to tease out the different elements. And then we, of course, are being responsible, as Dr. Rajiv said, to the student, the student who has gone far away, the student who is near the city, and how do you bring those students together? I have many international students who went back home thinking, OK, I'm going to take a two week vacation and then come back. They have not come back as yet because visas have stopped. You know, either it's in their host country or in the US, there's something that's happening. So, with the international students, I sometimes get up at four in the morning to meet with them. And students who are in Africa, broadband is very expensive. So broadband can only be accessed through certain hours at libraries or you know, where their parents work. And so the day goes on. And I know, as Dr. Raji was saying, I work much longer hours. But I also have the flexibility to take time off during the day to make my work work and to maintain my health and my sanity which are important at home because we're all working from home we had to figure out separate spaces because we all talk for a living and you know if you have four people in the house talking at the top of their voices 
you cannot, you know, be in proximal places where other people can overhear you. For me at home, that was the biggest element work-life blend. Now in STEM learning, there are two ways that I would say have been impacted. The peer contact and socialization was greatly influenced. And that's how you learn by brainstorming, by negotiating, by refuting, by agreeing. And all those things went because you're only by yourself. What you say is gold and what you believe is even gold. So we started doing working groups for that element. And I have two things that I have found useful. Role playing, so doing in the working groups, putting role plays where two or three people take opposing opinions, brainstorming platforms, and having those to be seen by a large number of students or faculty or staff has been very helpful, where people will say, you know, this is how I would do it. And someone would say, I wouldn't do that. And I'll tell you why I wouldn't do that. The other thing that I have found useful for STEM learning is talking to yourself. And most of us talk to ourselves, whether it's in the bathroom while we're having a shower or we're cooking, but I, st I started designing self-talk as a way to capture your learning of the day, recording it on the phone, listening it to within 48 hours. It really tells you what you know and what you don't know. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi. I, I, I think it's it's like when, when we say we are working long hours, there are disruptions in our routine. They, uh, as students are also, uh, if you're saying 25% of students are coming back to the campus, there are many students who are not coming to the campus. So my main question for the next session is, is empathy becoming a quint essential aspect of leadership? If so, how? So I would like to start with Dr. Rajiv. Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Satya. Because when, especially during this pandemic time, so it's really mean what uh, we want to do on this aspect. Uh, because uh, everybody is staying home and there are a lot of social pressure and then pressure from work, you have to perform, you have to show that you are worth it, worth of it to your employers, so everybody working under stress, and you have to be performer, especially in this time. So because before you can make excuses that, okay, you were on the way or you didn't get time and things, but now those excuses have gone, so you have to perform, so people feel a lot of pressure. So what we have to do, we have to encourage those people. We have to support those people who need help, and especially in this pandemic because of the stresses. So we have to take the personal interest as a leader in those employees, or even for a student also, it's the same thing. So when the student is also working under um, at home environment, and he cannot share his uh, 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 insight to other to what he can do with the friends he cannot do with the maybe parents so so he, they are all under pressure so we have to listen to them and and we have to be a sympathetic to them also and we should not to, uh, when they are telling you something we have to listen with the patience and sometime uh, as a leader you think sometime this is irrelevant but for the person on that condition, on that under pressure, this is very relevant question or relevant question, uh, not for me, but for him or her. So we have to uh, be in this condition, we have to need empathy and uh, we have to talk to all our colleagues uh, as a leader, as a friend, you can talk to your friends, and but as a leader, your whole institute is like your family. So you have to take all of them together and uh, uh, listen to their grievances, uh, listen to their problems, and uh, try to solve their problems. 
and don't put them pressure because I know some of the, my colleagues say that, oh, he cannot do this thing. Can he take two days nowadays even can be away for two days at home? I say, for me, it's not necessary. You come to the campus and how, what time you do. So you have whole freedom. You can take your own time. You can, because this is, uh, even we get a paper from research journals, they give us extra time. So those people also need extra times and uh, because of under this uh, high pressure kind of, I will say high pressure condition. So, mm -hmm. so this is very important, especially in the pandemic time. This is my, my view. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajiv. So Dr. Selvi, how about you? Definitely. And I think, um, especially the second wave, has tested all of us uh, much more than the first wave. Um, you know, like there have been stories that we have come across because our exams were scheduled. Um, as Dr. Rajiv was also saying, this is a very high pressure environment right now because although the academic session was broken, I think this, uh, instead of starting from August, most universities would have started from say September or October. But yet, by April, they all had to wrap up uh, their degrees. They all had, we, we had to give marks, grades. And that's when the second pan, uh, the second wave came up. And we, we had n number of stories of students uh, saying, you know, I have to go because I have to find oxygen for my parents. And what do you do as an instructor? And, I, I have to say, like friends, family, students, researchers, I think we, we all have realized that um, all these uh, smaller aspects, grades, courses, these are all very small in the larger picture. Like um, again, Dr. Rajiv, Dr. Vinay, Dr. Rashmi, they've all been saying that uh, taking care of self and also helping others to take care of themselves, I think that is a key and this situation has made us learn that even more. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you so much for that insight, Dr. Selvi. Dr. Vinay. Uh, I echo the, the points that were stated by Rajiv as well as Selvi. I believe empathy is absolutely the most important part of leadership. You know, you cannot be a leader without actually emphasize, empathizing on other people's troubles and understanding this. There are many levels, teachers, um, heads of the institute, I mean, lab heads, and finally heads of the institute. There are many hats. I wore all of these hats at some point of time or other. I taught a few classes for Delhi University students online. And there you realize the problems associated with bandwidth, which Rashmi was talking about. Some of these people are in Dehradun, uh, they went back to their houses, right? Some of them were in Northeast and their bandwidth was very low. You know, you, they, they find they come on and off, on and off into the class. So these are struggles faced by the students and you need to, you cannot be very strict and say, oh, you're not attending the class. They're struggling. They're struggling to even keep up. They're struggling to keep their focus on. They're actually struggling in many ways and many facets, which, I mean, they're staying home, some of them are living in large houses, I mean, small houses with large families. And, you know, these are the aspects which we can't even imagine or think about. You know, you don't know everybody's, every person's personal space. We don't know how they are. And, and over and about the, and as a lab head, next one, is to be, you have to be flexible. You know, what Selvi was saying about people falling sick, their parents are falling sick, or sometimes the friends, oxygen needs, this, that, I mean, it was a very different world, especially during the second wave. I mean, it's pretty sad and uh, very, very, I mean, time that tested most of the people in India is the second wave. A lot of people who are close to you or somebody you know or somebody somebody you know you know kind of a thing, they've expired, they've passed away. And a lot of people got hospitalized. It was testing times for many people, not for researchers in people at large, but you know, students, they are ultimately people, right? Uh, postdocs, employees. There are stories of uh, these kinds. So this is an important. As an institute head, there are things just become as a larger scale as uh, Rajiv mentioned. But eventually, you have to 
the underlying principle always remains the same you have to empathize with the problems faced by many and if you don't do it it doesn't matter what hat you wear you will be a failure and one of the last things that i want to mention is there is an additional conflict many scientists may have faced they have their own families to take care of their own safety concerns that they may have but they also have responsibility towards their students they also have responsibility towards the community to do the work right and this is where you know this empathy and this is where their personalities and how they actually deal with this comes into play uh, and i really i mean it's been a uh, testing times especially the second wave has been a testing times for many in india no matter which walk of life you are from absolutely dr vinay thank you and dr rashmi satyavati could i add one thing so i like to collect numbers and trends and i will i went through my emails last week to tell my boss i have written more emails ever than before i have written more positive sounding emails that say okay i do know what you're going through and i empathize with it however this is what i can do to help you so empathy alone is not enough what they also need the students from me is a word of encouragement a path forward so those emails i because i used to see these people in person you know on the walkway walking to my office walking to the library now when you're writing something in an email it actually takes more time you have to put in thought for every word you are saying many times i craft these emails on the weekends and then send them out during the weekday um and the response of students has been very encouraging to me that they feel that there is a light in that email there is a path forward so empathy does not go one way and now i'm finding the students are asking me which happened after 6 8 months how are you doing dr kumar are things okay with you so we are building human relationships where we are being empathetic because we are the grown ups but the students even though they are youthful young inexperienced just stepping out into the world they're also learning a key social skill of reciprocating empathy so i think it is been an opportunity to teach young people that you have the power to do good you have the power to be positive sounding you have the power to take that message and do something with it just yesterday i got an email from one of my medical students so medical students have to take board exams and this particular student had struggled and had failed twice now you failed twice you are on a flag you cannot continue anymore and he said i finally passed and you know i listened to you i did not disregard your email i read your email carefully and thought about how i could change my habits so it has been a moment of transformation because we don't have that smiling face across the table or a pat on their back but a way to say you can do this i can help you but only you can do this and that i find has been a, a big change maker very insightful thank you dr rashmi i i think this brings to the research aspect right like the, the life science research and the healthcare research has been the focal point uh, during the pandemic for the research and for several several institutes so dr selvi can you please give us one example of a project where it was difficult and yet you made it through you know you you made that project successful along with your students um okay i think i'll probably give an example um that's very related to the covid situation itself now 
gone. If you remember, I mentioned that, um, and that was the time I got to do some experiments by myself. And we had a, a qPCR machine, which had just arrived earlier and none of us had tried. So I remember trying to set up some gene expression um, follow-up studies. And then we get a letter from the collector, the district administration here saying, uh, could we please take away your RT-PCR machine because uh, we need to ramp up the testing facility of the state. And um, it, it was, we were having a chat about this and our director and um, Professor Sharma um, from CCMB and our deputy director, he said, but you do RT-PCR, that's your bread and butter. Why don't you just you know, opt for helping out the state? Why should we give away our machine? And I think that was a moment when we thought maybe this is the, the place where we can help out the society. But the challenge was that there were only three of us in the building who knew how to do an RT-PCR. Um, all our students were new and it, it was a huge challenge. But I have to say that the moment we expressed our interest to the state government and the district authorities, um, within a matter of two weeks, we had a facility set up. And I think this time last year, we were struggling to test even 50 samples because we did not have the right resources, the right personnel. Uh, but today, on a daily basis, I think 500 samples are being tested for the state government and the facility. And it, it's because we managed to get the right kind of people with the right kind of uh, attitude everyone wanted to do something to help out in the situation. Um, I think a lot of people have said that this COVID situation was a war-like situation and people people did respond back. So I have to say it, it was a united effort and it's, it's going strong. So just because of the people involved and the thoughts that they had. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Selvi. Um, I, I, you know, at, at the research laboratory, you ha you had a chance and and also an excellent opportunity, right? Just to to give back to the society with the right machines that you had and the skill set. Um, uh, Dr. Rajiv, as as a director of institute amidst the pandemic, um, how do you prioritize work? How do you prioritize uh, lectures and and and? Uh, work for students and for yourself uh, because as, as a technology institute it could be something completely different to you yeah uh, uh, satya you're right actually as a being a director especially in a pandemic time it's a not easy task so you have a lot of uh, pressure uh, and uh, and you have to do things in a right way that is also because one mistake can jeopardize everything for example if you are not very careful to bring in, because now what we are doing, uh, my our priority is to bring all the students who are at home now, to bring them to the institute. And we cannot bring all of them in one shot because it will be crowded. So we are bringing them in the batches. Like on this day, 20 people will come, on this day, 30 people. And once they arrive, and our priority is uh, immediately, if they are coming from other state or we ask them to bring their RT-PCR negative test. And after that, we put them in a quarantine. So we have the hostels where we have to put, we put them in a quarantine for six, six days. And on seven day, we do the, the RT-PCR. And during this six, five days, we have to work like their parents, right? So they will not go out. So you have to provide them food and uh, medical or anything what they ask and they need for, for the daily purpose. So th that keeps us uh, all of, uh, not only the dean with the student affair section, but uh, most of the people, all wardens, they are busy in that one to because the student is our priority. If they will, will not have a student, how you will do all this research, what you're mentioning? I cannot do myself research. You, you have a group, people work in a group and work in a collaborative way. So that, that's the only way. So. So students are the priority of the institute, and we have to take them as the uppermost task. And that's what we are doing right now. So every day you say, okay, this batch is completed six days. Now we take their RT-PCR. Until their report, 
even the people coming for rtpcr they come in the campus they, they don't need to go anywhere they will come to their uh, in the campus and they take sample and they give them a report so this is uh, uh, right now as a priority for us and now when the students are here they will demand so when they are home they they are controlled by their parents so now as a teacher or as a director you have to control them they will come sir i want to watch movie i want to go out i want to eat outside i am staying in a campus for three months or one year i have not seen the restaurant I want, so you have to deal that can and then we tell them okay this is not good for your health also it's not good for your colleague especially you bring something and we are a concentration of say 3000 people staying in a, in a hostels you, it will be infected very fast infection will go very fast and uh, at home your parents can take care here we don't have that many even faculty members they can take care of you so we, uh, so thought of our work gone uh, them parenting them actually and uh, even uh, we have a special people uh, to orient them okay try to explain them this is how we are working here you are now uh, we are your parents we are your family so we have to think about our members of the family and uh, regarding our research we are doing research after 12 o'clock sometime in the midnight so i still have uh, my group in europe so i work with them in the night to my own research but in the daytime if you can satisfy your student your faculty member your staff that is whole day is gone so so we are all working on this hard time and i always give them a message when you will do this good days are coming so this will be not forever there is a hope and now we learn that actually before when we were applying for funding we always say that we are wasting so much money in traveling how we stop that now even i asked my colleague can we have a face to face meeting he said that why don't you send me the link so, so, so face to face meeting we can have when two people are sitting in a room with a social distancing. Now, this is a trend. When we say we have a meeting, they will immediately ask, it will be online, is it right? Then you have to tell, no, no, this can be offline also if you want. So, now this is a um, uh, pandemic has given us and uh, we should use properly. And as India is as IT power, we should use its maximum and we should use it in the best way. That's what we, we are thinking. Thank you. Thank you. Very insightful, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, you, you are giving us, like, as, as a director, you know, there's so many things that we, as, as students or as researchers, sometimes do not take consider. Uh, you know, I so want to add one thing more, Satya. They came to me that, okay, my laptop is broken. How to fix this? I say, okay, we don't have. And we told, okay, who have a have a laptop problem come to us we will call a vendor in the campus he will come here and he will fix your telephone and laptop you don't need to go out so we are doing all that kind of uh, help to them thank yeah. you thank you we did so, that too yeah. <coughs> we had these what we would call open kiosks where they could bring a tool problem a device problem and there were two hours and you had to make an appointment because we didn't want everyone crowding there. Crowded, so you yes, got yes. appointments in 15 minute slots or if somebody could actually reach out to you from remote and tell you what to do to fix your device. So there were many things in that blended environment that if one solution was not going to work, one solution was not applicable, you had to have a plan B and a plan C in order to make sure the student had every resource available to learn and to be successful. So it wasn't one way for everyone. It had to be multiple ways for multiple profiles of students. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Dr. Rashmi. So uh, I, I think that there is a kind of focus that we would also need going forward. Right. So Dr. Vinay, um, how about you? So what would be your focus going forward for your students, for your researchers and group leaders? See, COVID has impacted every walk of life, but it has that's also extended to researchers, as Selvi has mentioned, 
uh, while the pace of research got affected due to multiple reasons, including logistics, like procuring reagents and all, impact of COVID was a lot more on careers of young researchers who are setting up labs in the initial phases and on the PhD students who are towards the end of their career, I mean, for PhD. They actually got, badly got affected. So, um, so it has been, this is actually the part which actually, I believe, taken a major hit in the research environment. I would focus more on these two groups. I mean, I'm not saying others are not affected, but the impact is not as high when you're a final year student trying to write thesis, trying to finish up one or two experiments, or looking for postdocs, or your young researcher trying to establish your lab. Impact is always higher. So this is something that I would like to focus more on. This is the population I would like to focus on. And the, you know, how do you do it? By, while well, evaluating them, or trying to provide support as much as possible. So one underrated impact of COVID is on the mental health, right? Unfortunately, in India, there is a huge level of stigma associated with uh, seeking the help as far as the mental problems. I mean, this these issues are concerned. It is important as a as an institute to develop mechanisms where people seeking help feel comfortable, and there is a certain space. Counselors, doctors are available to them. I mean, in their own way, in their own space. Maybe they don't want it to be uh, public, but one has to provide a mechanism for this. This is something I need to work on. Uh, the second force focus would be streamlining processes so that the delays don't happen. Now that we are getting out, make sure that what they need, we can get fast so that they can complete their work. So I strongly feel time lost in getting these reagents and equipments for research is time not spent in doing something important for the society. So, and then I kind of uh, echo what Rajiv is saying. Webinars have become the norm, right? But with adequate caution, it is important to bring, bring back the personal interactions. You know, there is nothing that can replace a scientist giving a talk on a stage where you can see the person, where you can see eye to eye contact. And the kind of things that you get out of that is not the same as an online thing. You're essentially talking to a computer. Though I see all of you guys, you're still talking to a computer, right? Uh, um, so this, um, this has a significant impact on the learning. I believe we need to go slowly and steadily that side. Finally, you know, it's important as a, as a head of the institute is to monitor the COVID situation closely, react in a timely manner to make sure that the people of the organization are safe from any future wave. Thank you Thank so you. much, Dr. Thank you. I think it was insightful. Uh, one a last question before we move on to the to the next session and the final session is to Dr. Rashmi. Uh, what were the aspects that you included uh, as part of the STEM learning, um, and which also kind of um, was a learning for you yourself as well? Well, uh, so I'll start with the learning for myself first. I had to learn how to manage all these tools. So we primarily use Zoom and BlueJeans. And so when I started working with your group, Satyavati, I had to learn, okay, what are the differences? But the learning is constant on my part and the student's part. Sometimes my learning is more implicit whereas the student's learning is more explicit. It is visible, it can be seen because they are assessed. They get grades and they get, you know, comments on their research or their work or their any aspect of their involvement in academics. But in terms of STEM, the three things that I emphasize most often became very prominent. How to capture the big idea, how to synthesize many details, and how to connect the minor details to lead up to the big idea. And so I developed during this time many PowerPoint slides, video recordings, and analogies to show students that these three were important before pandemic, and now they are even more important because no one is in front of you. The professor is not in front of you. I'm not in front of you. 
So capturing the essential big ideas is critical. And I'll give you an example. So I'm talking to a dental medicine student who's saying, you know, I'm not sure what the liver does. And I said, the liver is the biggest gland in the body. What do you think it does? And he said, I don't really care because I'm going to only work on the teeth. And I said, but you will care if the liver malfunctions. And how do you think it will reach the mouth? And he said, oh, I should think about that. And that's where that associative connection is becoming important. But it was always important. It had never lost importance. But now you are emphasizing it in a more visual way, in an analogical way, and actually asking the tougher questions, pinpointed questions that sometimes seem, oh, I'm being asked to answer, but it is for their good, for their success, and to show them the path of development, how they can self-check. Because at they study at two in the morning. I'm not answering emails at two in the morning. So I want to give them paths that allow them to self-check, self-assess, and self-progress. Thank you, Dr. Rashmi. I think the self-assessment and the self-progress for students is very reflective, right? It's it's actually the self-actualization, you know, it's to, uh, to really reflect, to really learn by yourself and and try to carve your own path in, in this case. So, so moving on to our last session, before we take in questions, um, uh, uh, there, there is one question I'm very keen to ask um, all of you is, what are some of the key learnings or takeaways that will continue to impact your life and that you will continue to implement in your life? So Dr. Vinay, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you. So learning from pandemic happens to be a bit different for different people right it depends mm -hmm. on their own personal experiences i believe as a common theme one thing that we can say is that we have learned how to manage our time and how to stay focused and how to actually cope with such adversity mm -hmm. so these these learnings that are coming from pandemic have they are useful for life at large actually Many people have lost families, friends, and this is what has happened during the second wave. This, we also have a better understanding of our priorities in life. That is what Selvi has mentioned during her earlier comments that, you know, all of a sudden you start wondering what is that we are doing in a very philosophical way when, you know, you lose your somebody loved ones or somebody, you know, a young something like 47, 48, 5, with young children passes away. So you start wondering about how much we actually kind of get lost in the busy lives, how much we lose our priorities actually, right? It's It kind of is awakening. So this is something else that one actually learns. People started appreciating small things of life, actually. I mean, I at least started. And my, my sincere hope is that we don't lose the, some of this appreciation of some of the things that we started doing during the pandemic we don't lose them once again get back to our busy lives and lose it all so that's the positive learnings uh, positive energy that one actually learned to live with should be taken forward thanks thank you so much dr Vinay. dr Raji, what are your key yeah. learnings yeah so my thing is that uh, since pandemic we always wish in our research life that we should work in a collaboration mode. We should collaborate with each other, not only within a country, within a department or outside world. So we learned that uh, collaboration is so important, especially in the pandemic time, we learn it. And how we help each other. And uh, that's what Vinay is also mentioning, that we should keep on doing, even after uh, the pandemic is over. And. Uh, uh, so, uh, as we know, if we work in a team, we can go a, a long way as work your individual and the pandemic has teach us lesson. We have to work uh, in a collaborative way and uh, 
in a team in a team manner and we should also this uh, uh, pandemic also give us a lesson that we should be a little bit patient and we should you have an extra grace actually if we want to navigate this uh, tunnel of pandemic and then hope uh, the good days are coming and uh, we we are coming much stronger than now before because of this uh, the things what we learn from the pandemic there are always good and bad things but we should always remember good things and this is how i see in the future uh, and the takeaway from uh, this meeting thank you dr rajiv so dr selvi how about you um okay i think my takeaway from this one year worth of pandemic time is that we've now started um kind of prioritizing our goals uh, in smaller packets we are not looking at what we want to do after one year or two years because we don't know what's up the road so what we have now started doing in the lab especially with my research students is we say okay we're going to do this experiment in the next two weeks and then we're going to we've started with setting smaller milestones and in the way we have started appreciating our journey to reach these milestones so i think earlier um again i have to say whatever my experience is has been in someone else's lab not as with my own research group but there we used to um say celebrate when we had a paper that was published when a grant was accepted but now what what we have decided is okay we've got our experiment hypothesis has worked let's celebrate let's celebrate the people who work towards it and um, i think that's the thing we've started appreciating the smaller things and working towards smaller goals and i'm sure together uh, they'll come up together and uh, look good thanks thank you dr selvi dr rashmi how about you so i'm listening to selvi rajiv and vinay and i am reminded more that being grateful for what you have and acknowledging it in a constructive way has been helpful i have also focused on letting go of things of any disappointments or regrets or interactions and that has been cathartic for me i have shared that message with many students and colleagues that if you have some past baggage try to let it go because this is what the pandemic has taught us that life is a gift it should be enjoyed one should be grateful for it and holding on to past grudges and disappointments is not helpful yeah and, and and then what are what are you hopeful for like like you know now that we have gone through a lot together in in different countries in different cities what is it that that we are that you are hopeful for so so dr rajiv uh, can we start with you yeah so you have seen that uh, we talking now we have got a lot actually we should be thankful what we got during this pandemic also okay there's a bad thing we should forget but we should always remember the good think about uh, now uh, we have learned how to teach online we have we can now teach online we we can teach offline we can teach in even hybrid mode so now your responsibility is even more because uh, you want to help not only the your institute the surrounding institute you can when you give this course the surrounding institute can also attend these courses mm -hmm. now you have a whole world is open for you and you can advertise i'm giving this course anybody in the world can be uh, can attend this course before you never think about when you plan your lectures you plan your lecture for your classroom writing on the whiteboard but not now but now you learn and how to you have improved your, your pedagogic skill also especially when you design your experimental setup i'm talking not about the research but for example btech students or mtech students we have uh, because i asked them up to my colleagues do you have a what about experiment they said don't worry we have make a youtube 
So we have a simulation for that and we do experiment and we show them. So, and same thing of my daughters are doing medicine. So they told us that they make a, a the dissection and they make a video, they show them on the video. So we learn now actually, and we should not give this away now. So this is the future learning. And uh, I was uh, giving this on a lecture on a new education policy. Somebody asked me that now IIT is catering maybe 10, 20,000 students. If you want to cater now 50,000, I say now it's not, it's not a problem. We don't need a classroom now. We have the whole cloud is there. And so we can teach them not only ourselves, we can teach our the, you know, some of the institute where they, they have a problem of faculty because they can, they do not have enough funding. The always a faculty enough strength is not there. They can choose those courses from our institute because they don't have a professor or teacher for that course. So this is the uh, takeaway message also. And this is what we see the technical institute like IITs. And uh, we know that uh, what is our strength now. And we can do a lot before we have not tested ourselves. And this is the biggest belief what we got in ourselves. And we can lead the country, even any pandemic situation, not only even COVID, even if there's something coming in the future, we are not ready, now ready. Teach our young generation, they are, even they are sitting at home. We can give them internship, even they are sitting at home. And we can help them both way, not only uh, by educational way, but even a psychological way. When, when Rashmi said that uh, when the email you write nowadays, we have to think what you are putting in the email. So still, I always prefer to talk them on the phone also, because with the phone, you can express much better than writing. Sometimes writing is very blunt. So you can take and you can interpret in different ways. So, so, so I will like to say that uh, we learn a lot and we are still learning for pandemic is not over, but we are ready and we can take uh, to our institute, our country or, or this world into a new level of learning. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Dr. Selvi, how about you? Um, so I think I'll, so there are three levels of uh, what I've learned and what I'm going to take forward. Um, so again, taking uh, kind of, uh, Dr. Rajiv had alluded to this earlier multiple times about this hybrid teaching uh, aspect. What I've seen is that when you are in a classroom, uh, there are always louder voices. There are some students who always speak up and there are some who never. This online teaching, uh, I think that has given room for these people who are a little bit reserved, but you know, after a class, they then write or drop some, uh, a message on the chat box saying, probably this is what you were trying to say. So I think it has given people uh, the opportunity to reach out. So I think moving on, moving forward, I am going to practice a hybrid mode of teaching wherein we'll probably have a little bit of offline interaction, like more of offline interaction, but some online interaction as well uh, to set the stage. Uh, the second thing is um, coming from Scotland, and people say I've part I've become a part Scottish person. There is a statement they say there is uh, no day as a perfect day because Scottish weather is uh, very temperamental. We learned that here. Like we, as I mentioned, we had this RTPCR machine and we kept on thinking we'd do something with it, but then there was an opportunity, and I, I think it has gone in the right direction. So, kind of uh, when opportunity comes your way, I think we should all reach out. And my final take home or takeaway message is that the whole pandemic, um, you know, there's always this complaint about how science and research um, is on a different track and society is on a different track. I think this pandemic has proven that science and society have actually uh, helped out each other. Like how many times we've heard um, our relatives and even kids talking about the R factor. So <laughs> it's, it's this reaching of uh, science and society um, that blend that has worked very well. So I think that there have been 
certain positive aspects and i hope we take and follow these forward as we move on thank you thank you dr vinay just to echo mrna rt pcr all those things have become household names you know <laughs> people would not have known all those things prior to this pandemic i would like to answer this specifically from the research point of view i mean where would i want to like an institute to grow after this kind of pandemic the reason i'm saying is when the pandemic set in ccmb i was not part of it but now so ccmb got into research in pandemic area see sars go to ccs csr at large and ccmb specifically they have set up diagnostics survey surveillance performed sequencing lots of genome sequencing and that helped been detecting variants but you know going forward as a research institute i believe it's important that we take part in surveillance we take part in uh, of the future uh, vaccine technology we know india doesn't have a mrna vaccine technology we are modernized coming in here with that so we as a research institute should take the lead in going for these technologies developing them so that our future if something like this comes knocking we are there so we don't have to worry about it but these technologies also have other implications not talking about the pandemic alone and sars cov to one thing it has done it has brought back the focus on infectious disease it's not that people were not aware of infectious disease but you know over a period of time it's a bacterial viral became research was not as important as research in cancer and other areas so it's brought back the focus it is important in that we actually do and perform cutting edge research in this country uh, on viral and infectious other uh, both bacterial and viral disease biology and that is something that i believe is important if we really have to be prepared for a pandemic 5 years down the pike this is what i want i'm answer this completely from a research perspective not from any other uh, bigger picture i appreciate what you said selvi do some of these things have become household names so i can actually communicate this easier now than ever thank you <laughs> dr rashmi how about you i think they all have said such good things so i'm trying to find something else to say that would add to what has been said I think going forward one of the things we have realized is that we used to do workshops and lectures monday through friday between 9 and 5 and now we are finding that when we are doing these events on sunday afternoons we get the highest number of attendees attendance has doubled or tripled so if we are in this hybrid mode why not continue those habits and maintain that outreach and teaching open for larger number of students for more students from different time zones so in the us we have four time zones then we have students technically right now i work with students in seven time zones so if i offer it on a sunday afternoon i am reaching out making things accessible and of course it takes time away but um uh, i can always manage my time on a weekday but you know connecting with students and reaching out and not depriving them of any learning opportunity is what i'm focusing on so making things accessible thank you very much uh, we are close to the time i'll i'll take up one quick question um, so uh, from a from audience uh, so the it starts with a comment and followed by a question uh, lockdown has taught us to live alone and many students like me have been living alone studying and working how can we stay happy and motivated with ourselves without judging ourselves i think an yeah excellent question and please uh, feel free to answer i think dr rashmi should answer this she is absolutely well placed to answer that okay dr vinay then i will take up your challenge and your kind <laughs> invite uh, living alone does not mean that you are alone there's a difference 
you might be physically living alone, but if you can be interactive in an alternative way, it could be helpful. You could set up, let's say, a Zoom call with one peer one week, with another peer another week. When you have these anticipations, hey, next time I'm going to talk to Rajiv. It makes my day exciting, and I hope it makes Rajiv's day exciting to think next week we're going to have a chat. So whether those chats are work-related, they are socially related, they are to discuss a movie that you have both seen. So there are ways that you can finagle that interaction without actually being in physical proximity. Thank you so much. Yeah, bit. Any, yeah please, please yeah. go ahead. I think one of the things which was mentioned both by Rashmi as well as uh, at some point of time maybe is that you have to develop some level of routine even in that fact that you are alone. If you can develop that routine and continue the online interactions with people, you would not feel that alone. When you are actually do not have it, means idle man's brain is devil's workshop. The less idle you keep yourselves, better you are placed to deal with this so-called living alone kind of a concept. So what Rashmi said and add to that some level of discipline would help people get through this phase. Thank you. We are very, very close to the time. So I'll, I'll very quickly summarize. Uh, there, there have been very, very excellent points. I try to pick up uh, just very small, but maybe to begin with. So uh, today we have discussed a lot on how to basically embrace the new normal, how to uh, set up disciplines to set up routine for ourselves and to be nice to ourselves. You know, first and foremost is to look out for ourselves, then look out for each other, and and to have empathy. Basis of empathy is respect to acknowledge that we all are in different boats. We are having our own struggles. We are having our own places. However, it's important to be uh, good to ourselves to have that extra grace. And this period has nothing but it has helped us to face adversities. And what is important for us to go forward is to prioritize, uh, to set smaller milestones, uh, and to be really grateful for, for what we have and to acknowledge what uh, what is uh, that we have and how we can take it forward. So yeah, thank you so much for, for being an excellent panel. It was very insightful. Um, I have learned a lot and I'm, I'm, I'm sure that even our audience have learned a lot. Um, and it's a very good weekend, you know, so it, it, it's, it's a nice uh, thought process that has triggered so many points and to, to really work on it so that uh, we are becoming a better human beings in, in, in future, you know. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you, everyone, yeah. who joined our session. Thank you.